I wanted to focus this presentation and meeting on end to end testing, but during doing it, other concerns and ideas came. So I summarized it because it's tightly connected to, to the strategies of testing. So it might be a bit more overwhelming and to start with end to end testing, what it is, I like the quote by Ken Dots. It's help a robot that behaves like a user to click around the app and verify that it functions correctly. We can call it functional testing or end-to-end. -end. And we have a really great article where it describes different types of tests and uh, why end-to-end -end tests are really great for confidence because that's what we want from the tests. I won't go through the whole article link is in the presentation. If you want to, but you can read it afterwards. The most important part is this graph or this illustration, because most known stuff is that tests go from cheap to pricey and from fast to slow, but there is another big arrow, which solves, which gives us the confidence and higher we go in the pyramid, the more confidence we have, because we want to make sure that the application is functional from the user point of view and hundred percent unit test coverage doesn't mean that user can do what he wants to do. So we want to cover his use cases and combine it in a smart way. So that we have enough confidence, but also enough of safety for developers without big trade-offs about slow tests. So the first thing that we need to handle is the setup. We have many possibilities, but uh, I picked up two most used. One possibility is single test environment or maybe multiple test environments, but with tests running on the same environment and it can be staging, pre-production, anything you can imagine. But the thing is that tests are running on one environment together. And the second option is environment per test. And I have a comparison. So for the environment, it's easy setup. It's really cheap because you don't have many instances, but it is really unstable because tests are data dependent. And if one test fails and screws up the environment, it is really easy for other tests to start failing. But there is bigger gotcha and it's hard to run in parallel. If we have tests run before the merge and we have multiple pull requests, we need to run the tests in parallel because otherwise it would block developers. But if we do so, and we have only one environment, tests can interfere with each other and fail for no reason. Another thing we can do is to run test cases in parallel. And this is a bit harder to do because it needs to have each test case truly independent on others. And another thing is that one environment is slower if we want to have it at least semi-stable because then we need to remove parallelism at all. And even for multiple pull requests, we need to run it sequentially, which means that developer who comes one minute later than the first one will need to wait for 15 minutes until his tests are started. And so we have other approach, which is environment per test. It is really great because it can run easily in parallel if we do some setup for each 
testing or HPR. It is completely isolated and therefore it can be really stable and data independent. If any test fails, we can check the database, we can check the test run and immediately know if it was case of one failed environment or if it was case for some real big problem. This makes it really fast because of parallelism and stability. It's passed from the CPU time and also from the developer point of view. And it is also really easy to have true data independence. It is easy to reset the data because we won't screw any environment for developers or anybody else. But it can be more expensive, especially if you have larger teams or a lot of pull requests, you might need more instances. And in some cases I saw that we've had 10 or 15 environments running and it can be really pricey, but uh, it is also manageable because if we have at least four or five environments, we can do sequential parallelism, let's say, and run the tests in, in batch on all the available environments, except the one that is not as isolated, for example, develop. Another con is that it might be harder to set up because you need to seed the data or initialize the instance with, with some data can be a bit harder to implement. There is also, or at least two articles about data seeding, how to provide data for tests, what are different principles. I recommend you to read it if you are interested in this problematics. And this article, even though it, if it means or talks about integration testing, there are some great tips what to do and how to increase confidence by tests. And finally, the slide, why this presentation was created. And it is because we've had some discussion with Panagiotis and there was also a, a previous meeting about unstable tests because text is changed and now the tests are failing. So we have three approaches of testing or three most used. First one is CSS. Next one is test ID, which is really well known. And the last is user-based and it is really propagated by Kent Dots, which is like big animal in developer world. And he is also creator of testing library and inspired many other libraries. So the comparison. CSS, it is already done. We have it, we have some selectors, it can be used. And you have many options. You can use classes, IDs, data attributes, anything else. But we have dynamic classes. And as you can see, the classes are some weird strings. That's because they are dynamically generated due to our usage of styled components or yeah. And ID, which is highlighted by a red line, it is not available on the other elements. So you might need some tricky selectors to get the data. And sometimes it will be almost impossible because it is dependent on the DOM. So if, dev if developers change the structure of component, tests will fail. It will happen sooner or later. This makes them unstable and hard to maintain. And also user, common user doesn't know anything about our classes or about our IDs. So it is not behaving like the user. We are trading confidency for 
our own our own comfortability and it might be a big problem sometimes for the user next approach is test id it is really stable and well known because it is recommended even in cypress documentation not so much in react testing library and it is a data item independent unless you want to specifically select some precise item in the array sometimes you just want to test that first item in courses is available and sometimes you want specific id but this is tests to data and that is problem but there are some cons this needs to be added we don't have it yet and it needs big communication between testing and development team because sometimes testers are missing some test IDs and they need to wait for developers until they edit then they find out that the data test ID is attached to different element because this element doesn't react to events that user does and therefore the tests can't run. Small problem is that this blows the DOM because as you can see, there is another attribute and it makes targeting really easy, but it's another attribute makes the DOM bigger. And also it is anti-pattern to remove test IDs on non dev environment, which was the case in the past because companies wanted fast application. And if they had like hundreds or thousands of data test IDs, it could make some impact on the file size, but it was really, really a small impact. So now it's anti-pattern to remove it. If you have it, just keep it everywhere. And for selecting in lists, you can use ID of course, or some order in list. And that makes it much more easy, but still it does not behave like a user would do. So the last approach is user-based. Big pro is that it behaves like the user does. And we want to test that app works for the users. And with test IDs, it might be possible that we target some element that is visible, but hidden un under some hidden overlay and user can't click it, but direct get to the element is able to do. So, so we don't test any accessibility and the app might be completely unusable to the end user. This might be data dependent, but only in case if you heavily use, have you use text for targeting. It is much better to use the accessible principles. And as I, as I have highlighted in this image, you can just target heading. You don't tick to target the exact heading. You can target a second section of heading because you know that second part of dashboard is always courses for inspiration. Therefore, you can detect some really big problems. We already had them in the past in the application because sometimes it, and in the past, it was much more common to just have diff or span with all click event. And this was really problematic because you couldn't focus the diff with or with reading mode and it made action impossible for user to do. This is detected by using of roles because heading is a role, button is a role and link, at link as well. Now I'm not sure if 
this video will work for you, but I linked it from the time. I can't see now. Okay. I guess I'm integration is not there yet, but I can give you like two minutes because it's pretty short part of the video. It's not whole video. So I can give you some time to play it. That, but the most important part is that, uh, now in Playwright, which is the framework we use, we can use some selector, for example, get by row and also some has text and this makes it really easy to target some row with some text if we need exact item in the list. In this case, they describe in, in the video, they want to delete item with helicopter, not the second item, but always item with helicopter. Doesn't matter if it's first or last or second as in this case. And if you would use just normal text selector, you would select only toy helicopter and then you would need to jump up to the parent and maybe another parent and another, and then find the delete button. In this way, you just target the row, which has helicopter text somewhere inside it, not in itself DOM. And then you can chain, chain the locators. So you target input and it needs to have tick delete. This makes it really easy for reading because it behaves like basically like human and also it is easy for developer. So it is a win-win. Yeah, but that's a problem that we have now. Okay. It targets the row, but it still targets the text. That's the problem we have now. We could use it on feta instance, but we don't test on feta instance and develop is messed up. The texts are messed up because we delete stuff and add stuff and we don't give attention to titles and things. So. Yes. That's why the, I've had the previous slide about the environments, because this whole stuff is connected. If we don't want to change anything, we can just add the data test IDs, but we will still have the problems of one environment. It will be hard to run in parallel and hard to have uh, tests for multiple pull requests. And it can still be data dependent, but with the test IDs, it is not this problem, but other problems still remain. So in the last slide, I have proposal of the approach, which might make it a bit better. Yeah, I guess we also should not test on FETA because it's production. If we do deploy to production, everything should be tested and be okay. I'm not sure output, how much performance is uses. Yeah, usually the tests are not that big CPU consumer, but it still needs some instance of the browser. Yeah, as said in the previous slide, it can be a, a bit more expensive if you have more environments because you need more instances of the browser, etc. And the last thing is from React testing library, they have some principles of testing and based on the quote by Ken the dots, which was two slides ago, the best way is to use get by row. It makes it less data dependent because you can target button in some section and you are not dependent on the exact course. But if it doesn't work well, you can use label text 
for testing inputs. Placeholder text is sometimes good, but better is label text and we have all inputs labeled. And the fourth is get by text, which makes the test dependent on the data and it makes it less stable, but as you can see, it's for the second option is for semantic queries, for example, images, they need to have out for being accessible to the users. And the last stuff is get by test ID. It is good for stability as in the comparison above, but the users don't know anything about test IDs. So we are testing the application from developer point of view or tester point of view, but not from the user point of view. And uh, there are problems I mentioned that you can target some element, which is not actionable for the user, but the application or tester runner can do it. And now next slide. And it is also connected to the stuff because we have our repositories and especially biggest problem is that we have tests in separate repository and it is easy set up. We already have it, but we don't have tests in the pipeline and it is really hard to have pipeline running through multiple repositories because it needs to fetch both of them, install dependencies. It makes it also longer and more problematic. And if you have maybe in the future, multiple applications, this is even harder. And the problem we've had was that the repository was unknown to developers. Before the previous meeting about testing, I didn't know we have some automatic tests. And because it was unknown, it was also unstable. We changed something and we didn't know that we broke the tests. So it made them hard to maintain. And now they are in a problematic shape because they are not updated due to all the changes. And there is a need for data test IDs. If we go the another way for monorepo, it is stable because developers will always fix the stuff that uh, they change and running in the pipeline is trivial. So it can be medium to hard setup because if we want to go just tests and web application, monorepo, it is really easy. If we want to have everything in one big monorepo, just like Google, Facebook, and other do, it will be really hard, especially in non-JavaScript code base. So I would suggest to just merge the testing repository and front-end application repository, but keep backend in separate one. Also. This makes it really easy to test multiple applications if they come later, because there is, again, no cross repository and it is known to the developers. It can be around by developers really easily during the development it can be even in the watch mode. So developers always though, they break the tests, which makes them stable and easy to maintain and it won't be only on Panagiotis or maybe some other QA people if they come, but it will be a responsibility of whole team. And there are some cons, of course, it needs to be done. We don't have it, but this could be really easy if we go just the way of merging with test and front-end application. If we would want to have Django in the monorepo together with front-end, I would advise to not to do so unless we are bought by Facebook or Google. There is also comparison in this GitHub repository. I wasn't able to 
I wasn't able to link it in this presentation because GitHub doesn't allow data. So feel free to check it. There are multiple opinions and articles you can check. And now when to run the tests, there is pretty big movement of people who run the tests only in the night. Therefore, even though we don't use it, I put it here. Our current approach is after the merge, when I get these tests and it is okay, but not great. I would say not great, not terrible 3.6. And another pretty standard option is before the merge. And the last is running tests always. There are some tools which allow you to run tests always in the, in the loop. And it can give you confidence because you know that you can connect the data of monitoring with the tests. So you can find the performance problems because if there is peak in usage by users and your tests start failing, you know that you have some problem. The comparison, yeah, in the night, you just have tests, but don't do it. It's pretty dumb. After the merge, you can detect the problems in PR, but you have to revert the changes if you find the problem. And it is also hard to get the output from the tests because they are not tied to the opened pull request and you can't easily open it. And it needs to run in the pipeline. So it's some setup, but it runs only on developer master because it's after the merge to some branch and it doesn't make sense to run the tests after merging to something else than developer master. And probably the most recommended approach is before merge because it easily detects problems in PR. And output is easily get because you just open it from the, from the pipeline of the pull request and you are just there. There is also no revert needed. If you find some problem, you just don't merge it and you urge the developer to fix it and don't allow it. Cons are that you need to run it in pipeline for every pull request. We already have is done. We just don't have tests that are run or we have some unit tests, but not end-to-end -end tests. So it would be just a matter of adding one command. And we also have the after merge development and master. So it is like it needs set up, but we have both pipelines. So not really big problem. And running tests always. It can detect problems as well. And the single benefit over the running tests before merge is that it checks health of your application. As in the screen, you can see that orange means that some tests failed and red means basically that pipeline kaboomed itself. But this is with pretty big trade-offs, you need to combine always and before merge, because if it runs and monitors your production or, or your develop, you don't detect problems in PR. So you need to combine it and it is harder to set up. You need another Docker instance and you need to have it like 24 seven running to be able to get as good data as in this screenshot. And this is the tool that allows this. It also needs some change in, my, change in mindset. It can connect to your repository and you can choose which tests are run. 
So if you combine before merge and always, before merge, you can run all the tests, even those that take really long and those that change some data, which is the thing you don't want to do on production. But always running tests can be those which check critical path so that the user is able to log in, change the course, but you don't really need to test some other stuff, which is less important to the users and to the customer. And the output, we are in current state, we have develop environment, which is not really stable because we do all the changes. We have text-based selectors, which are kind of user-based, but not really. If you want user-based, you need to start with roles. And then if the roles are not enough, go for text-based selectors. We have Poly repository, which uh, problems I mentioned, and our tests are manual slash and automatic. And it's like automatic tests that are being run manually. So I would say semi-automatic. Fast and easy approach is to have test environment and this can be pretty easily done. It just needs another environment, which will be used for, for development by developers. And we can do some scheduled reset. Maybe after each merge, it will be reset or, or every night, I don't know. It can be pretty fast to do if you don't want to go the ideal way. User-based locators, they give you more confidence. And the biggest earns you can get by semi monorepo as I said, merging just the testing repository and front-end application and switch to before merge testing. We already have this pipeline. And uh, it will be easy to just add a running and twin tests. Ideal way is to uh, spawn instance for every pull request and uh, test it in completely isolated environment, but there is not much of a win for the also full monorepo can give you more confidence and more reuse of the code. But it is for huge companies, not for startups, especially if you have backend and frontend in different technologies. So my suggestion is to go for fast and easy way. And I'm open to discussion. I have a question. Thanks for all these presentations, Peter. It's great. Would be. Can can I also run the tests also locally before pushing my changes? Yes. Yes. This is our wiki JSON, and we already have test command which runs just unit tests, and we have test all which does some static checks and also the tests in in different modes. I mean, you would you robot just, test. Yeah, you would just add another command, which would run the, the robot. Cool. Okay. So it means me, for example, let's say as a backend developer, I can, I want to probably change something in front of it and then I can just click one button and it runs the whole test also on my MacBook, right? Yes, you can either repository and run it locally, or you can run it on the, in the bit bucket through the uh, UI. Yeah. Cool. And do it even now. Can go to branches and let's say this one, it is alert. Run pipeline for the branch. And you just choose which pipeline you want to run. It can be 
feature, which does all the tests, but does not deploy it, or it can be completely separate, separate pipeline. Yeah. Cool. Any other um, question? Well, yeah. So maybe what about the reports? It's, it's like same with, with our pipelines that like you see the, if something fails, you just see only the pipeline law. This is the yes. to check what went wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It will be exactly the same. If I show, yeah, this one, for example, you can open the pipeline and you would see it as a separate part. So it will be test and then end to end test. So you can just open it and see the output. Okay, cool. And also in this end, this end to end test, it means the robot, for example, clicks on password reset link, let's say. And so you would mock, right? It doesn't send emails or it can do. There are also tools for testing the emails. I did on the event where they tested the emails and uh, that the links in the emails work for the password reset. So it is possible, but a bit harder to do. Okay. Well, because I'm thinking about the case where we have a profile delete function, let's say, and the robot clicks on delete my profile and then. So robot disappears or <laughs> what happened in that case? If it, if you want to delete your profile and uh, the robot does, uh, can check that you are locked out of the application and you are landed on the login page or something else. Okay. So it cannot continue. Got it. Got it. So it cannot continue the other things, right? It can use other user, it depends on the setup you, you can, if you want to test this flow, you can just create new user and then delete it. So other tests are not affected by yeah. this. Just as normal user. Yeah. Yes. Got it. Okay. And Panagetis, Panagetis did this answer your text problems with selectors? Yeah. Not really sure. Okay. Which strategy uh, we're going to follow or? Yeah, the thing is that with the merged tests and application repository, you will not be alone. You will write the tests, you will add more, but if we change something, we will, it will be our responsibility to fix it. Now it is your responsibility because we don't go to the, to that repository most of the time. So it will be teamwork, I would say. All right. Okay. Whatever you think it's best. Yeah. To give you some example of test IDs and tests, um, there was an application and it was tested in the HD resolution and in this resolution, the button for editing profile was hidden under invisible overlay. It was clickable, but not for the user because there was an overlay. And this is the stuff that is caught by user-based locators. That's just one small example.